My name is Knut Graham. I'm going to be talking about neuro-oral anticoagulants, the known and the new on these medications. They're called NOACs. You can call them novel anticoagulants just because of their new anticoagulation mechanism. Uh, they won't be new anymore, I think, in the next few years. I guess. All right, so the reason why I picked this topic uh, last three to last five to seven years have been you know, we've, we've, we've seen a lot of developments in this area and uh, we see a lot of patients being transitioned from warfarin which has been the conventional oral anticoagulation therapy to uh, these newer anticoagulants and many a times we've seen like absolute like new indications coming up and we're starting these patients on these NOACs as first-line treatment not just transitioning from warfarin. So I thought this is just going to make us all com more comfortable dealing with these medications and in some cases even prescribing these medications. All right, so here we go. Oh, sorry. So what are the NOACs that we're going to talk about? We'll talk about Pradaxa, which is, can you see it? Okay. All right. Pradaxa, which is Dabigatran, 150 milligrams, 110 and 75 milligram pills are available. These are capsules. Then you have Xeralto, available in 10, 20 and 15 milligram strength. We have Eliquis, which is uh, Epixaban, 2.5 and 5 milligram tablets. And then Cerveza, which is Edoxaban, coming in 15, 30, and 60 milligram strength. So these are all tablets. These three are tablets, Zeralto, Cerveza, and Eliquis. And this one is a capsule. I'll tell you the significance of that thing in a little bit. Um, if you're prescribing somebody a NOAC or a patient uh, the patients will have a lot of questions. Even you will ask a lot of questions to yourself. These are just a few of those. Is it even approved for what you're using it for? And you know, what if they bleed? How do you convert if they're already on warfarin to this new medication? So a lot of questions, and we'll try to answer some of these uh, during the course of our this presentation. So first of all, the mechanism of action. Uh, dabigatran, as you see, is a direct thrombin inhibitor. It's acting at this step on the coagulation cascade. Uh, and fibrinogen to fibrin conversion, this is what it's stopping by inhibiting uh, thrombin. So it's a direct thrombin inhibitor. All these bands, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban, are actually factor 10A inhibitors. So they act uh, quite similarly at this point on the coagulation cascade, where this is your common pathway, your extrinsic, and your intrinsic pathway. So FDA approvals, this is, uh, I, I think it's a very good slide because it tells you where all it's um, indicated. And good thing to remember is that these few indications that we're going to talk about for AFib, for prophylaxis in orthopedic surgeries, and for uh, DVT and PE treatment and uh, extended treatment. So most of these medications have been F FDA approved for almost all of these indications. So it's not very difficult to remember. However, this edoxaban, which is a new kid on the block, you can say, uh, it just got approved like a year ago in January 2015 for AFib and uh, for AFib uh, stroke prevention in AFib patients and also for acute treatment only. And it's not for extended treatment. So if you've just treated the DVT for three months, you could use it. But after that, if you really need something, then rather switch the patient back to warfarin or any of these other medications. So this is only for acute treatment. Uh, for orthopedic surgery, it was used in Japan. It's a pharmaceutical firm is based in Japan. So that's where it's approved for hip and knee replacement surgeries as well, but not uh, here in USA. So this tells you where you can use it. Why are we even talking about NOAC so much more than warfarin? These are the few advantages that you have. They act very rapidly. Within two to three hours, you are going to see their effect. So unlike warfarin, where you would start this patient on warfarin, it will take two or three days to get the INR where you want it to be. And the bridging is a problem. So these problems you can escape by using these NOACs. Dozing is fixed. Many a times, some you know patients come and tell me the doctor in the hospital didn't know what dose this medication should be on, so he keep he kept changing the dose, and it's actually quite surprising for the patients because they cannot even imagine that there could be so many variable doses for this warfarin, and they always tend to get confused with them. So variable dosing, and here the dosing is fixed. Minimal dietary interactions you will see with uh, NOACs. And warfarin, there's a huge list. We always see that in the Coumadin clinic. I really don't 
I mean, it's very hard to understand how they are compliant on these medications and all these dietary recommending recommendations. Sorry, drug interactions. You you do have certain important drug interactions, which we'll talk about, but warfarin has a ton of those. So if, whenever a patient's on warfarin, we're always looking at Hippocrates to find out if it's gonna interact with this, this new medication that I'm starting or not. Monitoring, you don't need any constant monitoring every few days or every few weeks or every month for any of these coagulation parameters, but you would need that in warfarin. Uh, some disadvantages, some of these medications are twice a day medications like Pradaxa, which is Dabigatran, it's a twice a day medication. Epixaban is twice a day medication. So whenever you're changing from once a day to twice a day, it always becomes a compliance issue. And clearance, if you see, that is one less thing to care about in warfarin is the renal function. You really don't care about the renal function that much because its excretion is non-renal. And here you have some renal, uh, you know, 25 to 80 percent of these excretion is uh, kidney related. So that's why you will have to keep the renal functions in mind. Antidote, if you see, we'll talk about the antidotes in details, but you will, uh, warfarin, we all know we can give vitamin K, FFPs to reverse its action. A little bit about the pharmacokinetics. It's a very busy slide, but we're just gonna focus on a few things that are really important here. So these are all oral medications, first of all, so they're all absorbed through the gut. That is one thing. The other thing will be this P-glycoprotein that you're seeing everywhere. In very basic terms, what P-glycoprotein does, it throws away the drug so that it's not absorbed in the circulation. So wherever you're using a P-glycoprotein inducer, that will throw away the drug. So the effect of that drug will become way less. And if you're using a P-glycoprotein inhibitor, then the concentration of that drug will go up. So we'll talk about those drugs. Inducer, rifampin is an important inducer that we need to know. And inhibitors, a lot of your azoles, ketoconazole, and some of the protease inhibitor medications are P-glycoprotein inhibitors. And then the other interaction will be with the cytochrome mechanism. So you see dabigatran does not have the cytochrome thing going on, but these other three medications at various varying levels, they are being metabolized by the cytochrome pathway. So some drug interactions will be from that. The other important thing in this slide to note will be the renal excretion. You see 80% of Pradaxa is being excreted through the kidneys and a little less with rivaroxaban, epixaban very minimal, and edoxaban 50%. So this will actually help us guide uh, what doses to pick or where we should use these or where not to use it. And one more thing to focus is the half-life. If you see 12 to 17 hours is the half-life for dabigatran and five to nine here, nine to 11, 12. Why are these important? Because when you're thinking of reversing the effect or waiting for their effect to go away, you're actually waiting on about five half-lives to pass. So for five half-lives to pass with dabigatran, it might take two to three days, and it'll take way less with rivaroxaban, which will be out of the system by one and a half day or even one day. Um, so the same thing, just in a different way. We talked about the mechanism. The bioavailability, why do we need to know about the bioavailability? So dabigatran is just three to 7% bioavailable. What does that mean? That when you're taking that pill, just three to 7% of it is reaching your circulation. And out of these, you will see bioavailability of uh, rivaroxaban will go up to 80 to 100% with food. So you have to take rivaroxaban with meals because the bioavailability goes up in case of rivaroxaban with that. Dabigatran, why is this important? Is It comes in a capsule. If, this, if you break this capsule or crush this capsule, its bioavailability will become like 70, 80%, which you just don't want. That's not the way it was designed to work. So you have to keep it low that way. Maximum Tmax, if you see, you know, they, they will reach their maximum concentrations pretty quickly and within two to four hours you'll start seeing their effect. We talked about the metabolism and half-life, dosage form, and dosing frequency. So just focusing on one drug at a time, we'll talk about their indications, their dosing, and some of the clinical trials that support uh, th these medications. So for AFib, if you have a good creatinine clearance, more than 30, 150 BID is the dose, and 75 BID if your creatinine clearance is 15 to 30. For DVT and PE, 150 BID is the dose again, but you need five to 10 days of parenteral anticoagulation. This is very important. There are just two of these NOACs will require initial therapy with 
Lovenox or heparin or something for seven to 10 days, after which you can safely start these medications. Why is it that way? Because th this is how these drugs were studied in the studies which were done, okay? Reduction in the risk of recurrence. So if you want to continue the patient on that treatment beyond the treatment period, then 150 BID is this the same dose that you're going to continue. And these new different uh, strength pills that we just saw on the first slide, 110 and 220 milligram, this is reserved for your hip replacement uh, patients, surgery patients. 110 once a day and then 220 once a day is the dose and 110 is on the first day. This is the clinical trial uh, with Pradaxa called the RELI trial. I'm gonna be talking about a lot of trials, not too much in detail, but just to give you all an idea about uh, how extensively were these medications studied and how many people, what were the major uh, findings on, in those. So what this trial did was, uh, they enrolled about 18,000 patients and 6,000 received Pradaxa 110 BID, 150, 150 BID, the other 6,000 people, and another 6,000 receiving warfarin. And they followed these patients up for a median of about two years. The objective was to demonstrate non-inferiority of each of these medications when they compared it to warfarin. So what were the results on this trial? So what they found out was that the 110 milligram BID dose was as good as warfarin in preventing strokes. The bleeds were less with 110 milligram dose. 150 milligram dose was actually superior to warfarin in preventing stroke. So it's a pretty good drug because it's superior. However, the rate of bleeding is similar. It's not more, it's just similar. So you could use this if you really wanna prevent strokes. And uh, intracranial hemorrhage was way less, actually one third uh, of what they were seen with uh, warfarin. And the other thing is the GI bleed was actually higher with Pradaxa. So here's the limitation of Pradaxa where you should not use it on patients who already have peptic ulcer disease or bad GI symptoms because it can worsen it. Why does it worsen it? Because the capsule that I talked about, it has a tartaric acid core to each of those little pellets it has because it carries its own acid in that pill. So because of the, all that acidic environment, the rates of GI bleeding were higher. And then there was this very controversial kind of thing that they found out that MI rates were higher with the higher doses, uh, was higher with both, dose, both doses of uh, dabigatran than warfarin. So MI being higher, that just makes you think that, oh my God, I should not use it. However, when they, uh, they just found out that, you know, a good meta-analysis was done and then which finally showed that there was an absolute increase of only 0.2% uh, when they did that meta-analysis on seven different studies. So that fear of MI is not that major thing that should influence your decision to use it or not. Okay, so similarly like you have the trial for uh, use in AFib, we have this recover trial for patients who had an acute DVT or a PE and the results if you see, they. The same thing, they did 150 BID dose in patients who've just had an acute VTE and uh, they treated them for about nine days with uh, parenteral anticoagulation. And this is what they found, that it was very similar and the uh, safety profile was actually also very similar. So major bleeding was very similar. So it can easily replace Coumadin in that way. Uh, and remedy and resonate trials, these were two trials that were done to uh, establish dabigatran as a good drug that could replace warfarin in the setting of like extended treatment or prophylaxis of DVT in patients who've already been treated for uh, the set period of time, three months or six months. All right, so if you wanna convert patients from warfarin therapy to Pradaxa, how will we do that? Basically, whenever the effect of warfarin goes away, when your INR becomes less than two, you can switch them over to Pradaxa. Converting them back is a little different, like if, you, if your patient has dabigat, is on dabigatran and you wanna change it to warfarin, it just depends on the renal function. If the renal function is really good, you're gonna get rid of dabigatran very quickly, so warfarin will take three days to act, so you have to start warfarin three days before you discontinue. And similarly with higher rates, as the rates go higher, you have to discontinue dabigatran accordingly. Since it was 80% renally excreted, it's really important to know these things, uh, that it will depend highly on the renal functions. 
If you want to discontinue it for a surgery or other intervention, this is a very common reason for consulting us, like what to do with anticoagulation. So at least one to two days is when you should wait in patients who have good renal function, and three to five days if the renal function is a little, little less, or if you are going for a major surgery that can have a bigger bleed or something. All right, so this is something new with Prodaxa and with Noax in general. Since it's a crazy fight, one competing with the other, so the antidote is important. Idirucizumab, I can pronounce it better after pronouncing it so many times, Idirucizumab, Prax bind. Five gram injection, it is the first antidote to the Noax that is available, and it is just for Prodaxa. It has been developed by the people who actually made Prodaxa, and they were working on it before they even released or published their trial on Prodaxa. So they were working on it from long time ago and it just got approved last year. What is this? This is a humanized monoclonal antibody fragment. What it does is it binds to the dabigatran molecule way faster and with a higher affinity than it will go and bind to thrombin. So basically neutralizing it eff its effect. The recommended dose is five grams IV. I was struggling hard to find out whether LSU has it or not, but the pharmacy would just not let me know, or they were not aware of it or something, so, but I wish I could tell you that. So this is used in emergency settings. It has been FDA approved. Five gram IV is the dose, which is given in like 2.5 gram you give first as a five minute infusion. Within 15 minutes, you give another dose. And common side effects, headache, hypokalemia, which I don't think you'll care much about if a patient's bleeding in the brain or something on Pradagza. Uh, what is the evidence behind this Prag spine? So it was FDA approved last year, we talked about that. So there were three trials which were done on healthy volunteers who were taking Pradagza. So they gave Pradagza to a set of people and then they gave this iterucizumab and they saw the effect being reversed. Uh, within 20, like very quickly, and then effect at least lasted 24 hours. But this is not the basis of approving it. The basis of approving it was this reverse ad trial, which is actually an ongoing trial, and just based on the interim analysis results, this medication was FDA approved by the accelerated program. So what they did was they, they planned to enroll about 300 patients. So just, they had enrolled 123 patients till when this analysis was done and they gave it for the indication which it is supposed to be given for, which is uncontrolled bleeding or emergent surgery. And what they found out was the, so ECT and DTT, which is a care and clotting time and dilute thrombin time can give you an idea about the Pradagza activity. So these levels were checked and in 89% of the patients within four hours, the entire effect of the Pradagza was reversed. So, which was pretty good. And uh, since it's a life-saving kind of medication, it was approved by the accelerated approval program by FDA. Uh, you know, after this was released, there's a huge, you know, a very tough competition uh, going on with uh, the other medications because the other three NOACs are now hustling to find out another, like they are working on an antidote that's supposed to release later this year, but they're afraid that, you know, this will just take on the market till um, their antidote is released. Okay, now we talk about Xeralto. So we talked briefly about Pradagza. What about Xeralto? Xeralto website claims that this is the highest or the most prescribed NOAC. Uh, and we see that a lot on our patient lists, uh, medication lists. 10 milligram, 20 and 15 milligram pills are available. This is the dosing thing. 20 milligram daily is actually the dose that you give for patients with a good creatinine clearance for AFib. You need to lower the dose just because it's also renally excreted up to 50%. And so 15 to 50 cc's uh, per minute, if their renal function is less, you lower the dose a little bit. Uh, for DVT and PE, you also have the same uh, 20 milligram dose. However, for the initial three weeks, you have to give 15 BID. So this is something that's very important because in Pradagsa we were seeing that you need to do that parenteral therapy, so you need to arrange Lovenox or heparin or something initially. But in these patients with Xeralto, you can just start the patient on Xeralto at 15 BID dose right away. You don't need that Lovenox or bridging. Or, so that can save a lot of admissions and uh, blood work. And then next we have uh, for recurrent DVT and like if you want to continue the patients for DVT, on it, then you just 
continue that 20 milligram dose. This 10 milligram tiny pill is actually for hip and knee replacement patients. For knee replacement patients, it's recommended for 12 days. For hip, it's 35 days. For creatinine clearance less than 15, you should just avoid rivaroxaban. So this is the clinical evidence, just like you had RELI trial for Pradaxa, you have this trial called the Rocket AFib trial, which was a landmark study published in New, New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. So what it did was took about 14,000 patients with a moderate to high stroke risk, CHATS2 score of at least two or more, and then they uh, randomized patients to receive 20 daily of Xeralto versus Warfarin. Median follow-up was for 590 days. And then what they found out was that rivaroxaban and Coumadin are like it's non-inferior. So rivaroxaban is non-inferior to warfarin as far as efficacy is concerned. Even the safety profile, it was non-inferior. It's not superior. It's non-inferior. However, the major bleeding rates, which we're most concerned about for intracranial bleeds and all, they they were much less. So which is good. So here you have an alternative to Coumadin, which is a once-a-day pill which is quite similar in efficacy, quite similar with the bleeding rates, and way lower intracranial bleeds and all, so why not? So this is a good uh, medication there. Just so that you want to remember Zeralto rocket, I got a little rocket. For people who like to quote trials and look smart, everybody wants to do that. So I'll try my best that you remember the names of these trials at least. So this, this was the rocket AFib trial. This is Mr. Einstein. He has nothing to do with our trials and all, except for the name, the thromboembolism trials with rivaroxaban, Einstein investigators, okay? So for acute DVT, for PE, for extended treatment, all named on like Einstein studies, okay? So acute DVT study, they took the Einstein investigators, about 3,500 patients have randomized to receive uh, either rivaroxaban or they received Coumadin. And then you have this continued treatment study where they're actually giving rivaroxaban to half of them, but they have, they're just comparing it with placebo. Like, let's just give rivaroxaban to half and the rest, not, rest are not being treated at all. So this is placebo controlled and that is actually with comparing with warfarin. These were the results. So even though you see the VTE rate was a little higher in this uh, Coumadin group, However, the, you know, the p-value of 0 0.001 is for non-inferiority. Same thing, Xeralto is non-inferior to warfarin in uh, acute DVT situation also. In continued treatment study, you see that this is way better, which we can expect as well. So it, the p-value is for superiority here. And then this is the safety outcome. We see that it is quite similar safety profile when you're comparing it with warfarin. Uh, rivaroxaban for PE, again, one less name to remember. It's just Einstein all the way. So you have your Einstein PE study that enrolled patients from March 2007 to 2011. About 4,800 patients they enrolled, half of them receiving rivaroxaban, almost half of them randomized to receive standard therapy. And then what they found out, again, the same thing, quite similar in activity, so non-inferiority for the efficacy. For safety also, it's not inferior. However, when you talk about major bleeds, they are way less. So it has some an edge over uh, Coumadin when you're talking about the major bleeds. Now let's switch topics to orthopedic surgeries and DVT-PE prophylaxis. So we have a lot of patients on our teams who've just had a hip surgery, or we see these patients in the clinic who've just, in the Coumadin clinic especially, who've just had a hip surgery or a knee surgery, are on Coumadin. Some weird regimens of Coumadin, which we're not sure about what to do. By the time you'll change the dose and bring it to therapeutic level, their time is over to get anticoagulation. Like you just want initial 35 days or 10 days. So what are the current recommendations? What should we be doing with these patients who receive hip or knee replacement? So uh, the, gu the guidelines that I'm going to talk about are, have been, are from uh, American College of Chess Physician Guidelines 2012. These were the latest ones available. So what they recommend is that you must treat these, you should, they recommend treating these patients uh, like with anticoagulation for a minimum of 10 to 14 days. Any of these agents can be used. They have a little bit of a preference, which we're going to talk about. And this is grade 1B evidence that means like, a good recommendation with moderate degree of evidence. So for patients with major orthopedic surgeries, 
10 to 15 days was the minimum, but they recommend that you do it for at least 35 days, which is better. And then uh, low molecular weight heparin is still the preferred one. No matter what these NOACs keep doing, they're still saying go with low molecular weight heparin just because of the evidence and the data and all that they have with the safety profile. And so they're still, they prefer low, low molecular weight heparin over all these medications. However, if a patient doesn't want to take these injections, doesn't want to stick themselves, so if, they, if you really have to pick, they were in favor of apixaban or dabigatran. There are a lot of trials supporting this thing too, but I, I cannot really go into each one of them now. But apixaban and dabigatran will come next, and if not these, then you can just pick any of those in the first list that we talked about. So this is how it's going, Lovenox, apixaban or dabigatran, and then others. Talking about apixaban, we already talked about pradaxa, about rivaroxaban, which is Zeralto. Then we have Eliquis. Why you should know about this medication is because this is rampantly being used in our hospital. Eliquis and the last one, edoxaban, are very much in use uh, in our cardiology department. So 2.5 and 5 milligram pills are available for non-valvular AFib. It's 5 BID dose. And you need to adjust dose to 2.5 BID, but it's just not based on renal function. So when would you lower the dose with Eliquis? When two of these are, are present, if you have somebody really frail with a body weight less than 60, or serum creatinine, which is more than 1.5, or age is more than 80. Only in these patients, you would want to lower the dose. Also, you would lower the dose if a patient is on these dual inhibitors that I just talked to you about, ketoconazole, nitroconazole, ritonavir. So I just imagine an HIV patient with very low CD4 count with some fungal infection. And you will cover most of these medications which you should avoid in these patients because they are dual inhibitors of cytochrome and p glycoprotein, which will increase the concentration of this medication a lot in these patients. So in those patients, you need to lower the drug or try and avoid these medications. Um, the important thing is no adjustment is required for mild, moderate, or severe renal impairment alone. So it's kind of becoming a preferred NOAC in patients who have renal failure. And no dose no dose adjustment is required for hepatic impairment, but here you have to care about the liver because this medication is mainly excreted through the liver. So, uh, you know, severe impairment not recommended with moderate also, there's not enough data. But <coughs> renally, you're very good to go with this. Dosing on the DVT and PE treatment, 10 BID for one to seven days. So again, which is pretty good because you don't need that parenteral therapy just like you were requiring with Pradaxa. So you don't require it with uh, Apixaban, you don't need it with rivaroxaban. Then 5-BID thereafter, if you want to continue the treatment beyond the actual three-month period or whenever your intention to treat, and after that, you would just do 2.5-BID. And for, knee and, hip for uh, knee and hip replacement surgery, it's also the tiny dose of 2.5-BID, which we use for 12 days in knee and 35 days in hip replacement. Okay, so another picture for you guys, Aristotle, Study. This was the NEJM trial published in 2011 for apixaban for reduction in stroke or other thromboembolic events in AFib patients. So we have the RELI trial for Pradaxa, then you have your uh, ROCKET trial, and then you have your Aristotle trial, which is what it did was it enrolled patients from 2006 to 2010, got about 18,000 patients enrolled in 39 different countries. So you just understand this, the expanse of this these studies, like these, these drugs were actually very extensively studied. And then what they found out was that apixaban is actually superior to warfarin in preventing strokes or systemic embolism and caused less bleeding. So for the first time, we're actually looking at some superiority thing and bleeding rates being actually lower than warfarin. So I give them two stars here, okay? <coughs> And then this is the same thing just depicted in the, these Kaplan-Meier curves and where you would see that uh, event rate, like uh, stroke rates and all are more with warfarin, less with uh, apixaban with a you know, good p-value here. And here you would see major bleeding is more with warfarin, less with apixaban, and this is also clinically significant. So it's pretty good. So that is your Aristotle trial, and now we're talking about the VTE prophylaxis. Just the name for, you know, amplified trial, and then it established apixaban to, you know, actually a little bit better there too. 
So it was as effective, but the clinically relevant reduction was 69% in all the kind of major bleeding. So it's a very good choice. Drawback being it's a BID dosing, unlike your daily dosing in the others. Now that all these medications are scrambling to find indications, to get FDA approved, getting antidotes and all, so they started exploring these medication use in other conditions as well. So for ACS, this was the appraised trial that was done where they found out, where they actually intended to lower the rates of MIs and cardiovascular mortality in patients who've just had an AC, uh, acute coronary syndrome. So these patients were either on aspirin or aspirin and plavix, and then they started these patients on apixaban as well. So when they did that, they found that it was a disastrous study, and it increased the number of bleeding events without a significant reduction in ischemic events. So why was the study even done? Because similar study was already done with rivaroxaban that had shown some promises. It had actually <coughs> reduced the number of MIs and all, but that was very preliminary results, and on the basis of that, nothing is being uh, recommended, but that was just the in initial uh, uh, you know, effort, and they just continued on that, but it was a big failure. Last medication that we're talking about is Cervesa, which is edoxaban. These are the manufacturers, not definitely not from US. It's Deitch Sankyo. The I, you don't pronounce it. I actually had to go on the pronunciation thing on Google to say it correctly, Deitch Sankyo. So indications in dosing, 60 once a day, 30 once a day, renally dosed. So this is, again, a once-a-day medication, just like your Zeralto is. Important thing to note is that you have an upper limit there with the renal functions. Why is that upper limit there? Because if your renal functions were higher, the studies showed that ischemic stroke rates went up. These medications were being excreted out at a, you know, at a really good rate and wasn't as effective. So, and this kind of becomes a limitation sometimes because when we actually look at the lab results on our uh, epic and all, it just says more than 60, it doesn't give you the actual number. So that kind of becomes a limitation. You might have to go back, dig deep into like whether it is, like where, what's the number for that reactant <coughs> clearance. And then 30 once a day for this. Acute DVT and P uh, PE treatment, we don't have a lot of trials here just and to discuss just because there are two indications only for Cervesa at this point. You have atrial fibrillation, stroke prevention, and for acute DVT and PE. Uh, treatment, not for longer prophylaxis after that. And you're lowering the dose in this case when you have the renal function like that and body weight less or P glycoprotein inhibition again. Same thing that we talked about there. Important thing is you're requiring this five days of parenteral therapy here as well. Just like in Prodaxa, you were requiring this extra day, few days of parenteral before you could actually use this medication. This is by the trial, engaged trial, by the Timmy Group in Boston, and uh, this is what has established this adoxaban as, uh, you know, as a good drug to compare it with warfarin. Uh, published not too long ago, 2013. Here you see that it's a randomized, double-blind, double-dummy trial with 21,000 patients enrolled. So the strength of the study, power of the study is actually a little bit better than the others because they enrolled 14,000, 18,000. So a lot more patients were enrolled in this study. And it was a three group kind of thing. Some get uh, 7,000 getting warfarin, 7,000 getting 60 milligrams, and then you're getting 30 milligrams. Uh, and the mean follow-up is also for longer. It's 2.8 years as compared to the other trials, which were for two years or a little less than two years. Efficacy endpoint and safety endpoint remain the same for this study as well. And the results were, just to summarize it all, it was also non-inferior in stroke and systemic embolism prevention. It's not superior, it's just not inferior And the major bleeding is actually, here it establishes its superiority. With warfarin, you would see more high-dose adoxaban less, low-dose adoxaban bleeding rates are way less. This, these are all clinically significant, so this is actually superior when you're talking about the bleeding rates, but otherwise the stroke prevention is quite similar. Uh, just the summary of the same thing that I just talked about, but the lower rate of, the lower dose of edoxaban was associated with a slightly higher rates of ischemic stroke though. And uh, GI bleed, so all the bleeding rates are actually going down with edoxaban, the only exception being GI bleed here. So GI bleed is a problem with edoxaban and with pradaxa. 
this is just a good summary of these things that we got run rivaroxaban, apixaban. These were the major trials, and we just talked about all these things. Uh, here, it, I, it should just be uh, similar. And bleeding rates are way less with apixaban and edoxaban. MI is going up here in dabigatran. Dyspepsia seeing more in these two. Dosing is twice daily for apixa and dabigatran, and rivaroxaban and edoxaban is just once daily dosing. This is the time for which patients on Coumadin in these studies were therapeutic. So this is considered a decent uh, control rate. And here, there's a little bit of an advantage here because 68% of the time, patients were actually therapeutic on warfarin in these studies. So I was just about to end quoting all these studies. And then I found something really interesting. The, like edoxaban, we just talked about the engaged trial for AFib. So it is also indicated for acute PEs and DVTs. So this was the Hokusai VTE trial that was also published in New England Journal of Medicine. Why is it named so? Because of this gentleman who's a painter from Japan. He was a Japanese artist from the Edo period, and I think that's where the name Edoxaban is coming from. Edo is now currently known as Tokyo and is also the headquarter of these Daich Sankyo headquarters. So this was a study, just very briefly, about 8,000 patients being treated, half of them receiving heparin and adoxaban, and half of them were receiving warfarin, heparin uh, thing. And then it was non-inferior, and the bleeding rates were significantly less. Cost of these NOACs, so the big question is the cost of these NOACs, because these are more expensive, we all know. Comparisons are like crazy. I just went to goodrx.com and pulled up all these rates. These are actually the full prices of these medications. You will see these are all comparable, very similar, or maybe even same. And Cerveza, a little cheaper just because I think it's a new medication, so they're trying to be nice. But uh, when I actually talk to the, our cardio department here, who are the ones who prescribe it on a regular basis, there are good treatment, prescription plans, and all these things available. I went to the pharmacy to find out how much will it cost a Medicare, Medicaid patients, but they would not tell me because every patient, everybody has different kinds of coverage and they would not know unless they enter everything in. But the plans were as good as for Eliquis and Cerveza, I, I actually found out like $4 a month for a whole year. So if they could be on these kind of things too. So, which is very good. They're making all these medications more and more affordable. Most of the insurances will, a lot of these insurances will cover, and 20% is the copay on that, which kind of makes it more affordable. And uh, that's all with this. Talking about the antidote, with these three medications, we didn't talk about an antidote, so factor 10 inhibitor antidote. that has to come up, they have to come up with something or the other now. So endesinet alpha is the one which is being uh, you know, the trials are going on for this. It's a specific reversal agent for these factor 10A inhibitors. And it's a decoy protein. It is cat catalytically inactive. It's not, it's not a prothrombotic and an antithrombotic or anything like that. What it does is just going to bind to this factor 10A inhibitor that we're giving, sequesters it, gets it out of the, out of the system. So that's what it does. And it's expecting FDA approval in mid-2016, which is this year. The talk would be incomplete without talking about the bleeding and what if your patient bleeds and all, and what are the options. We don't encounter these situations that often, but we can. So major bleedings with dabigatran. Now we have the top thing being our reversal agent that we talked about, idiricizumab or pragspine. And these prothrombin complexes can be used. And other, these, other than that, it's just mainly supportive therapy, all kind of platelet infusions, blood transfusions. And uh, hemodialysis is one thing that's there with Pradaxa because it's 80% renally excreted, so you can get it out of the system if there is a major bleed. With rivaroxaban, also, you know, we're still waiting on this antidote to take over. And till then, we just have to deal with these, you know, not very good evidence with these prothrombin complex concentrates as well. If there's a minor bleeding, you just do local hemostatic measures and kind of just wait, wait around for the medication effect to go away, which will eventually go away in one, one and a half, two days. Uh, important drug interactions, just as we know that the, all these medication interactions are from cytochrome and this P-glycoprotein pathway. Important thing here is that a lot of your cardiology medications, which you, your, you would think the patient will be on for AFib, 
interact with this to with varying degrees and some of these which I thought will be important is dronedaron if you see it's a very potent P glycoprotein and cytochrome inhibitor so it can increase the concentration of dabigatran to up to a hundred percent so you would really want to avoid that and then certain dose reductions are recommended so interactions are there with cardizem, verapamil, dronedaron so cardiology medications then rifampin as I talked to you earlier about, it's an inducer, it's gonna help throw away the drug and the effect of that drug will go way down. So we'll try to avoid this medication because it uh, you know, affects this. HIV medications, big time interactions because they're also uh, P-glycoprotein inhibitors. The azoles, like we talked about earlier, again, it's increasing the concentration of these medications like crazy and you have certain uh, anti-epileptic medications which are reducing the effect as well. So which one to choose? Now we're left with this thing and it's just based on a detailed study of all these trials and all and which one has shown better effects with what. So if, you know, main thing I consider one is like patient preference. If they just want a once a day dose, then rivaroxaban and Cervasa are the ones that are once a day dosing. GI upset patients, don't, you have to avoid those two. So these, these are the ones, apixaban, rivaroxaban. Renal impairment, these are a little better. Apixaban, I would say, is a little bit better than rivaroxaban because you still require some dose adjustment. Like I talked to you about this trial about rivaroxaban in preventing MIs in certain patients. So, you know, if you have to pick and this is one of the criteria, then you can think about that. Patients who've had previous strokes, so these two medications have shown better results. Uh, I think that'll be all for now. I hope you liked it and would get something out of this. Any questions? This valve you can see is What's that, sir? It was virus presence of valvular disease. Uh, I think it was just not studied in the patients with microvial and valve replacement patients. Yeah. There was actually there was actually a study with products on a valve of uh, AFib and that showed that it actually increased the risk of prosthetic valve thrombosis as opposed to Kumar. Since then there has been not, not many studies on valve patients. That is why this is not indicated in patients with valvular heart disease, valvular AFib. So only for non valvular atrial fibrillation is when you would use a normal antibiotic. Should increase the thrombosis yeah. rate. Any patient who has mitral stenosis or anything, you would not use uh, uh, these medications for It was just studied on Pradagma, I'm not too sure. But they just excluded. Uh, Any other questions? Yes. You know. Yes, sir. What is the cost of the antidote? The cost of the antidote? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I tried to find out from the pharmacy, but since they didn't seem to even have a couple of thousands, I would assume if the medication costs that much, the antidote will be like a precious in the Pradaxis study, uh, you mentioned that 150 milligram reduces the risk of stroke compared to Coumadin. Yeah. But the absolute risk reduction was only 0.5% and number needed to treat is 200. Is it worth, you know, the cost and the bleeding risk that we should, you know, consider? So the cost, you know, when you're considering these NOACs, the cost also include, you know, I know the warfarin doesn't cost that much, but you also have to include the cost of coming in, getting these blood checks, you know, for the lab, for all these visits. So it's a combined cost of all of that. And the inconvenience it causes to the patients as well, making it a little less compliant. So that is also one major. One thing that still worries me a little is that the, with Coumadin, although Coumadin has a lot of drug interactions, we can measure the effect that that yes. has on anticoagulation. Yes. These other drugs, have, you've shown a lot of, not, maybe not as many as COVID, but a lot of interactions and 
not just with drugs, but with liver and kidney function and so forth. And we have no way of knowing whether they're over or under anticoagulation. That is a major problem because these do affect these coagulation parameters, but at varying degrees and cannot be really. Yeah, I mean, but no. Pradaxa, Pradaxa is the only one where you have this occurrence clotting time and a dilute thrombin time, which can give a very accurate uh, picture of how much anticoagulated you are. But with factor 10 inhibitors, there's real, you can check the levels of these factor 10 inhibitors, but that's like kind of reserved. It's not a very common thing to do and reserved for research purposes and all that. But yeah, there's no like PT, PTT. They, will, they can be prolonged, but how much and how much are you reversing their effects? Fly, flying blind is scary. <laughs> yes, it is. But then you also have to add the cost of if a patient does get a stroke. So many people more are getting stroke with warfarin as compared to the medication. So the burden of disease also adds on to the cost as well. There have been like a lot of studies in the Journal of Medical Economics finding, which have actually shown that patients on NOAC or NOACs are saving money, not wasting money, just because you're preventing so many adverse events. For society. <coughs> Individual, it's much harder to measure. <laughs> yes, for individual, it's these, with, with these drugs, yes. the patient gets on a stable, apparently stable regimen that the drug doses don't change as long as the other drugs don't change. Is that correct? Yes, and you and you need to modify the doses if you're starting them on, you know, all your IV medications and all. If you're sure. doing that, then you have to readjust the dose. Or maybe just switch it. Yeah. Right, if you change it. Switch it to Coumadin or something. If but that if things are staying the same, yes. have they looked at Lee White clotting times? Uh, that's a, an old way of looking at clotting, okay. which a blood and a form is taken over the yes. forearm. Yes. And the decision is made in exact depth, <coughs> and the technician measures exactly how long it takes to clot. And that's very consistent. We don't use it because we're like, stuff to We used to do it in our college yeah. days. I think most so of the trials is there, tags as well. They use there, tags as well in most of the trials, which they have like absolute bleeding times, but they also measure stuff like how thick is your blood, how strong is your blood, how fiber. Well, is that, that consistent? I'm just asking, is, have, has it been looked at since we're looking at a way of can you find uh, whether somebody is adequately or inadequately anticoagulated or dangerously overcoagulated. No, it may be that an old simple test uh, at would least answer not that. what I've encountered in all these studies okay. and trials that I've investigated and looked at. So, yes, sir. So, looking at all these clinical trials, what basis do they Attorneys have for all these ads to say bad drug, drug heart, all these things. But in the midst of midst of all, we have to make a decision. And the antidote will really help. I think you know once it's approved. Now that we know that there's something that we can use to reverse the action of Pradaxa, I think that people people will get more comfortable using it. So as long as there's an antidote, people should get more comfortable using these. But it seems. You've got an alternative with warfarin. Mm -hmm. If it's equally effective and equally and either the same or less side effects, yeah. what basis is there for a suit? You can't be legally held. Yeah, we live in the U.S. and it's just you know patient preferences and all those things. And compliance, I would say that Coumadin requires compliance, but these medications too, because you really need to follow them up and. Make sure that they're taking it. If you're missing a dose or two, the effect of the medication just goes away. <coughs> Patients can have a stroke in that time, or so. They also need monitoring. They also need uh, monitoring in the sense like regular visits. I'd like to speak to Dr. Greenberg's point. Actually, it's an excellent point he made that you know the good old Coumadin. We have to remember that the Coumadin is a medication that has been there for use, for use for years and years, and we have a way of monitoring it. But having said that, you'll see more and more newer anticoagulants. These patients will demand them. And the way the studies are done, they are big studies. You will see in terms of uh, using as medicine uh, practitioners or by cardiologists, more and more cardiologists, more and more electrophysiologists I've seen have been prescribing these medications these days to the patients. 
Non-compliance to anticoagul use of anticoagulant is not an indication to put patient on novel anticoagulant. That's the first thing we need to remember. Say you just want to start. If you could not start a patient on Coumadin, you cannot start that patient on a novel anticoagulant. That's the first thing. So the reason all these trials were done to demonstrate non-inferiority to Coumadin was because the investigators always knew that Coumadin itself is a very, very, very uh, good anticoagulant. That was well understood. There is no problem with, with Coumadin in terms of its anticoagulation. The problems with Coumadin were the dietary compliance, the patients may having issues with the diet, the patients having issues with the, you know, repeat follow-ups visits for the INR checkups. <coughs> that was the reason that they wanted to look for alternatives. Now, that, there is no advantage, to be very frank, all these trials were non-inferior, were designed for non-inferiority. Only one trial with the Pixaban showed some superiority and that was done because already all the trials had shown non-inferiority, so they could now take the, you know, uh, they could now design a trial to prove some superiority. They, they would not dare to do that as the first trial on their, in, on, in their study because they knew that Coumadin is the gold standard. So, no, first thing is non-compliance would never be a reason to, for you to put a patient on novel anticoagulant. If a patient is compliant and you think, he belie you believe that this patient is, has demonstrated compliance either to Coumadin or is going to take his medications good, you can put that patient on novel anticoagulant and you don't need to get him for follow-ups or a significant uh, amount of follow-ups like INR checks or anything like that because that's not indicated. So remember that part uh, one. And then dietary issues are obviously not there. And then just patients like them. Yeah, that's what we've, we've realized because we prescribe them so much and patients come back, they're so happy not having to come to the clinic so often and all that stuff. Uh, so, so the patients will demand more and more of these medications and more and more electrophysiologists will be using these in the future. I'm just saying that they are the future of anticoagulation for now. And uh, we have to understand. And these companies are very smart, by the way. These companies, all these companies, of they, they have a boxing fight going on with each other all the time. If you see, oh, I, uh, I am once a day. You are twice a day. I am, uh, I cause strokes. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, but you've been, uh, you've been shown to cause MIs. You've been shown to cause stroke. You are indicated in DVT. You are not indicated in death. So they are always fighting and trying to justify one over the other. But to be very frank, there's no uh, superiority of one has, has been demonstrated that there be one They're superiority of one. They're more similar than different. They're all si similar. So in choosing one over the other, you just have to look at the contraindications of the one, like kidney They've function and all those. compared to warfarin, but are there any studies comparing them? No, to not yet. Not yet. There are no head-to-head -head comparison no of head these medications yet. that are published. And there will be, I'm thinking. And there are newer, more anticoagulants on their way is what I know yeah. that. There's another weird name that I can't even... Now, Pradaxa says that, oh, you were not using me, but I have an anti antidote. So, Pradaxa has started coming back. Because people had stopped using Pradaxa. People had started using Epixipan. Because it was once a day. So, everyone started using it. Sorry, twice a day. Now, people started using Adoxaban. LSU. Why? Because it's $4 for, uh, per month for the whole year. While Epixipan is a little more expensive. And Epixipan is twice a day. So, Adoxaban is once a day. So, Adoxaban says I'm the best. Why? Because I'm once a day. And I uh, am $4 on the $4 list. So that's why for free care patients in this hospital, we are using Adoxaban, while we were using Epixaban two months back for all those patients. So it's just a fight going on between these, uh, these to promote one over the other. But remember, good old Coumadin, for most of our LSU patients, is actually very pretty good. Because if you are suspecting non-compliance and you want to start a patient on anticoagulant, the f best anticoagulant start would be Coumadin. Because you can demonstrate this patient is compliant or non-compliant. And once you prove compliance, you can then try to switch them to a normal antibody if you want. And you can skip more doses and maintain. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And when they come to the hospital, they're like they do every month, you know the INR, okay, it's high or low. All right. Thank you all for being here.